I just saw two uh, nice mule deer bucks that are laying down up uh, next to each other up the hill here. So we're going to get out quietly and move move uh, slowly and try to keep them so, so they don't uh, spook, get up. So I'd use like a two to 400 millimeter lens um, and shoot it at 6400 ISO because it's pretty dark in there. But they're in a nice spot for just a portrait. So let's see what we can do. Now there's some sticks in front of its face, so let's move a little bit to the right, okay? The one on the left is the nicer one. So right now it looks like a kind of like a bodiless mule deer. But wait till his ears are up, like or, that actually is kind of an interesting vertical. But they always look better when their ears are up. He's listening behind him right now. But he'll move his ears forward, hopefully. But it's just kind of an interesting portrait. Nothing great. But I would um, shoot at a low depth of field so you get rid of a lot of the background focus. So shoot like five, six, or six, seven. And it'll blur the background a bit and make it a little more painterly. But have your shutter speed or your ISO is still up at 3200 or 6400 the other one on the right is not as doesn't have as big as antlers so it's not quite as trophy like but it's a pretty animal but there's a lot of brush in front of it so vertically he fits better Let's see how his ears are back now. So, all the big ant animals that have their ears, whether it be horses or deer or moose, always look a little weird with their ears back. So you kind of want to wait till they hear something in front of them then they'll move their ears forward to get a better listen. He's listening for something behind him. Sometimes when they put their ears down, they're bothered, they're not bothered by us. We're far enough away, but they're probably just finished feeding and now they're just digesting and taking a break. It's a decent scene, but not, not award-winning scene. I'm shooting it in a video right now, so it's a 60th at f11 at ISO 1250. But if I'm shooting <clears throat> still, it is 6400 ISO 7.1 f-stop and a 500 of a second so I can blur the background a bit. It won't have much depth of field. It won't have all the busy grass so prominent. So I can, but I want at least seven one with this extender on it for lens quality and sharper image. So it's almost all the way open pretty much. So let's go um, down the road see if there are any moose down at the uh, by the river okay the, these guys might you know get up in an hour or so we can come back this way and they might be in a better position and in a um, better background it's a bit uh, a bit messy but see how it's got its ears up now that's because that car stopped and those kids are talking and 
now it's getting a little curious about the people walking down the road. Now it put its ears back. So now you can see what the difference is between ears up and ears back. That's ears back. And that's ears up. See how much more interesting it is? It looks like an alert animal. It's looking at something. It's got, you know, the attention of these tours have stopped here now and they were running and talking. And so it got their got the deer's attention. So now he's comfortable again. He's got his ears back. So, okay, let's go, huh? We're dri driving down one of the back, back roads of, of the, the park here. And this is one, this is one of the better places to see pronghorn. And I can see a few lying down in front of us here. And they're just off the, the dirt road, maybe 75 yards. So we'll just drive up slow because they're a little bit shy. And then we'll be quiet and slip out of the car and set up our tripods or our longer lenses. And, uh, you know, see what they do. And then we want to look for some nice background. And there's some nice mountains in the background, not the Tetons, but the, some lower hills with some color. And actually look at this, see this pronghorn way out there too. So that they're, you know, depends on the individual personalities as to how shy they are. But some are are very accepting of, of people, and others are skittish. So, why don't you stop and let me look here? Okay. Orchard. I don't think that's it's gonna. The grass is short. Kind of oh. boring. I think we should go up and see if there's something better. Okay. Let's pass these up. So right now we have a, some antelope on the left here. Some were lying down and there's a buck over there. And on the right side here, we have a single buck who I think if we wait a few minutes, maybe a bit longer, he might want to go join the herd. And, um, so we're just gonna wait and see. It's just a waiting game now. And, but there could be a photo op with these guys with the mountains in the background. Right now, that's kind of the time of the morning when they're just resting and sleeping. So the activity is low. But this, this guy might make a decent portrait of a pronghorn. So we'll just, just wait and see. Tom, how much in wildlife photography is it just waiting and seeing? Oh, uh, most of it's waiting and seeing. Um, I'd hate to count the minutes and hours and days and months and years I've spent waiting for a particular picture. So it's, you have to be very patient. I grew up hunting ducks with my father. We'd sit in the duck blind for a flock of ducks or geese to come by for days and days and days. And, and maybe we'd shoot two or three in a week. And so I grew up as a, from the time I was a baby and, and through my teenage years when I was a hunter, learning that patience, you know, will pay off. And that's fortunately it was a good lesson for me because I thought that's what you did. That it was natural, so I do it now and it's not a big deal. And I like watching and observing and learning. So, um, that's one of my gifts, probably from my dad, that he taught me to be patient. And so these two right now, that buck, one buck kind of laid down, but this buck now is coming towards the herd. And he's kind of going at an angle. We can move up a little bit maybe, and, and um, he's, he's feeding, he's relaxed, he doesn't care about us. So when you guys are, we will stop and just slip out the door and be quiet and don't disturb him and um, see if we get a, get a portrait of him. These guys are getting up to go feed and the mountains are really nice right now. So let's go over there, okay? No, um, that's a two to four. Yeah. That's perfect. Now the bucks are just chasing each other. See, that's the big buck there and the behind. Yep. He's chasing off the younger one, so he doesn't mate with his girlfriends. 
We won't get too close. They're, we'll see, they're, they're interested in mating right now. They're not interested in us. If we, if we stop every so often, they will be calm. And the park regulations is you can, can be uh, closer than 25 yards. So you think we're 150 or 180 now, 200 yards. So we're in good distance. They've laid back down, so they're calm. So what we do, what we'll do now is we'll walk that way, away from them, angle that way, and they'll think we're a bunch of farmers, okay? And then we get over there and we'll angle back over this way. And we'll keep doing that until we get into a nice range. If you walk directly at animals, they don't like it. They think you might be a hunter or something. So we'll all head that way and try to stay in a tight ball, okay? Okay, so if you hold it like this, you can be and put your elbow in your, into, your body. into your body. So you're cradling the lens. A lot of people hold their lens like this yeah. and it's really wobbly. So this is just like a rifleman would shoot. One of the few A pluses I got in college. It was rifle. Rifle marksmanship, okay. yep. See how, see how calm they are? No bother? Don't look at them either, okay? We're out here fixing the irrigation ditch. Might want to come over here. Okay. Okay, a couple are moving, so we're going to go back this way now. Okay, we'll take a few from here. With, with the mountains in the background. So focus on them and have a lot of depth of field, like F14 or 16, and the shutter speed of 500, 800. I'm at ISO 400. So they are shy animals. We'll shoot from uh, pretty much from th this distance. They're, they're feeding calmly now. We will move a little bit to the right. But the idea is zigzag and not go towards them. Um, we're 300 yards here. and But you know, there's a lot of us. So if you were by yourself, you'd be more successful with getting a little bit closer. But they're just a little bit shy. So we'll let them do their thing and not bother them. And, and just do the landscape with the animal. And it's quite nice right there, you know? Try to, try to uh, get them when they're walking sideways and you can tell that they're antelope, that kind of thing. So, and beware of the background, but the mountains look beautiful right now. The storms are, the storm's coming in obviously, so we're getting some more dramatic clouds. By this evening, I imagine we might you know, we might be out of Tetons because of the cloud cover, but maybe not. It might be really nice. I'm going to focus on the pronghorn. And then I'm going to recompose and check my level. See, I have the grid screen in there, which is really nice because you can see that your horizon is level. I'll zoom in a bit. Keeping the tetons a little bit larger, move down, focus on the pronghorn, raise up a little bit, recompose. It's locked in. Got it. Okay. Now that makes sense. So now you have this, this image. So those of you who aren't on autofocus lock, in the Canon you'll have to do. Got it right there. Got it, yep. So I recommend that. A lot of people like to use this, but then you have to keep the diode on everything, and then you're sort of a slave 
to where the focal point is instead of making the best composition. Okay. So I think these guys, they're spread out nicely. And if we walk over this way a little bit, we get a couple more shots and then we'll go back to that buck. It's beautiful light on the ground. And the other thing is forget about the pronghorns and just shoot the, the tips of the, the peaks, the high peaks. Because uh, with that dramatic light, it's beautiful. But the shadows on the peaks are really nice. And the light's a little difficult, so look at your histogram. Does everybody understand the histogram, kind of? More or less? Okay, but you're a little fuzzy, right? Yes. Okay, yes. all right, so we're going to just talk about the histogram. Move it so you can see the histogram is there, or if you move it full frame and down again, you'll see the histogram is perfect. Y you know, you have details in the, in the shadow, although this is a very flat image, so it's not a good, this is not a good example, we'll do one later. But you have detail in all the shadows, what shadows are in the mountain, and you have detail in all the white spots. So you have detail in the white clouds, you have detail in the snow. So that's a perfect histogram. Now I'll show you what will happen if I change the, and you're at a minus three, that's what I said on Nikons, um, especially the older Nikons, it's a D4S, it's not older but I prefer a minus three when shooting. So I'm gonna to go to, I'm gonna go accentuate it to a minus two. And I'm gonna take the same picture, go some geese, I'm a little bit late for the geese. Now, I, this is my exposure compensation, which is equal to the histogram as importance because this is how I don't, I don't use bracketing hardly ever. I bracket by using my exposure compensation. You look at the histogram, it still sits, even at a minus two, these cameras are so sophisticated, have so, so great dynamic range. Even at a minus two exposure, it says here that there's still detail in the, in the black areas, but you're right on the edge. This is dark, so this is under exposure, and this is the light. So I'm gonna go one more, to a minus two and two thirds. So we're starting to lose the, the shadow areas and we have so much room here with the whites. Okay, and I'm at a minus 2.7, but the dynamic range on these cameras is phenomenal. So you could still print this, it would be fine. And it might be fine because this is really making it look dramatic now. So you might want to really underexpose it because midday like right now, it's kind of boring light. So what the ice, that tells me right now is you've underexposed it. But look what happens to the dark oh, yeah, clouds yeah. and the light. So that's why this is so important. So yeah, that's pretty well. Underexposing with this midday light. Well, it's sometimes dramatic. It depends on the scene. You, you know, if you're doing grass, it would not do anything. But with those mountains and those shadows and the clouds, that makes it more dramatic. And yet, you know, you have all the detail in the shadows. You know, it's still not that too far off. There is a point at which I'll put it at minus four. Of course, it's gonna be really difficult to see in the back now. It's, you know, you don't see it at all. And, but you say, okay, what the hell does the histogram say? It says you're clipping, you're just barely clipping the yeah. shell. Now I'm gonna go the other way. We're gonna do uh, overexposure. So the, your perfect exposure was a minus three, Point. okay? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna go the other way at a minus, let's just say a minus, uh, I mean a plus, a plus 1.7, one and two thirds. Now, even here it looks like it's blowing out, right? Yeah. Now, the histogram says you are now losing detail in the whites. That is, this is the wall for the, the um, highlight. So there's no detail in some, in everywhere there's white in there. No detail in the mount, you know, the snow and the clouds and stuff. And so it's gonna be washed out. And you won't be able to bring it back, back up, basically. You, that's gone. That's what I always say. If you're going to err on one side or the other, err on the underexposure side. Okay. Save the highlights. Then you can get them. This also has the option to have the highlights flash too, yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That uh, gives you a, a better, 
I mean, that tells you right away mm-hmm. if you want to do that, but I tend to just use the histogram. Yeah. What does it mean in the middle of the graph when it goes all the way up to the top? Nothing. It, nothing? It just okay. it means that all the shadow and, and uh, highlights and stuff, are, it's like monochromatic. You don't need to worry about the mountain range. Mm-hmm. You just worry about right and left. Okay. And with this shot being so flat, is that why ours all had a tendency to go? Like, it looked like right. it spiked in the middle? Exactly. But if there hadn't... Well, if you had a, a variety, okay, I'll shoot, I'll shoot this scene here. I'm going to put it back on a minus third. Or, or, or shooting it. Mm-hmm. Exposure. And see, you can see the shadows there. Now that scene, see how the, see how the histogram looks different? Like this part is the dark area. That's the mountain. This part over here is the white sky. Okay? So, but neither are clipped. So you have detail in the white sky at a minus third, and you have detail in the dark mountain area. And so minus three, but you go to, okay, we're gonna to go to minus one, say. Same scene. And it's, it's pushing the limit here and there. So that's a bit dark. So you're gonna start losing detail in, in the shadow of the mountain. And so if you went to say, Two, two thirds, according to the histogram, you're losing detail in the shadows. Oh, so what you want to do is basically keep your peaks, you know, away from the walls in the middle. Okay, and you don't have to but have any concern of putting the peaks together or trying, because that's just telling you information. It's just you telling you, you got shadow, dark areas, right. you have light areas, light area. you have a mixture of things. Got it. That mountain is flat and it's monochromatic basically, and that's why you're getting this one peak. So this little exercise we just did was the value of approaching wildlife, and that comes with um, a lot of experience, mostly. Wildlife doesn't like you in the general sense. They don't like you walking directly towards them, whether it be a bird or an owl or a crane or um, bison or whatever. They get nervous if you're walking right towards them. So the idea is to zigzag and pause and wait and wait till they calm down if they start moving if they start raising their heads and you just stop and you give them plenty of space and typically you use long lenses that's why i have you know big lenses and and the you know so you don't have to get right on top of stuff you know i get so bored with portraits and portraits and portraits so i like the landscape and animals so the way you can get close even if you have shorter lenses is doing a zigzag and pausing and goofing around and you know kicking the cow turds or whatever playing like you're a farmer, and the animals relax. So that's what you want, relax animals. You don't want butt shots. You want front shots, side shots, or whatever. So that's rule number one with photographing wildlife. If you're out in the field, give them respect, give them space, use long lenses. And if you want to get closer to them, then do not approach them directly. We just talked about the histogram, and that's the over and under exposure of a scene. And this is really flat light, so we, had, we saw where we just had basically, you know, a um, histogram is in the middle, all the peaks were in the middle because that scene against the Tetons is fairly monochromatic in a sense. Not a lot of um, light areas, highlights, or deep dark shadows. And then we shot this way, there's a deep dark shadow on Jackson Peak there, and there's some light on the cottonwoods and light in the fields. So then the histogram is more like this. We try to keep it off the right hand side which means you don't have any detail in the whites like in the clouds or the snow and off the left hand side uh, the walls so to speak that means you don't have detail in the shadows if you're going to in some situations you you say there's a so there's a bear in a in a light area and behind it is deep dark forest i always go for the bear of course i don't give a damn about the deep dark forest i don't care there's detail in those trees up there I care about this detail in the in the bear's hair or the moose's hair or the bison's hair or whatever. When we find some bison, there'll be another good point because your meter will read that the bison is really dark and it will want to overexpose. And then the bison will be too light. So if you're going to err, err on the side, generally speaking, of the highlights, preserving the detail in the highlights. You can lose the shadow detail. It's not a big deal. Of course, everybody has their own opinion about that. But ideally, you say both. And again, with these cam- today's cameras, they have such a dynamic range. It's not like film that uh, you have to be c- c- 
kind of lame not to be able to get both, except in extreme conditions. But that's why you use your exposure compensation button. That's why you, if there's some question about the scene, you then uh, look at your histogram and it will tell you right away. Do not rely on the monitor in the back because out in this light, you can't tell. The histogram tells you the truth. Let's go sit that box there. What I like about Tom, uh, what, what I like about you, Tom, is that we never know what you're thinking. You know, we never know what you really think about things. Uh, no, I actually want. Instagram idea after that. I actually wanted to read you a couple of comments from folks online. Uh, we have Denise Burridge who says, "I like that he's showing them to try and then do other trials." and that not any image is wrong, but to see what you can do in camera. Um, Amelia says, I've never seen a more detailed and informative on-location shoot on Creative Live. Kudos to Tom for his instruction and explanation, as well as the crew for capturing it all. Vintage Soul, this section is worth buying the course by itself. Just listening to how his mind works while in the field, what he's thinking and how he operates his camera is extremely beneficial. So thank you uh, for being so <laughs> open with, uh, with those folks. That's kind of a scary comment. <laughs> <laughs> Very scary. Thank you. Um, Thank you to her. Anybody have any questions? I've got kind of a funny one here that I like, but if you guys have any uh, good questions, then I'll ask you this one from Beach and Dog. Do you have games or methods to pass the time when you're waiting for so long? Because one of the things that you have talked a lot about is patience and about having to sit out there for a long time sometimes. Two to three hours waiting for one shot. What do you do to pass the time? That's a, a common question, actually. Uh, um, especially when I was photographing like the resplendent Quetzals the other, mm. yesterday, um, in that session. And I was there for 12 hours a day. I'd go in at daybreak, and since we're close to the equator, it was really long days. And I'd leave it in dark. But <clears throat> there's no way, I mean, I've taken books with me, and, and um, in, in this case, I was in the blind. The, my only visibility is one little slit I had cut with my pocket knife in the canvas here and the slit where I put my lens. So otherwise, I was just in this dark hole. But <clears throat> I found that the moment you take your, you know, I'd always be looking through one of the holes or through the lens. The moment you distract yourself with books or journals, I usually keep a journal and sometimes I, just, I do will journal and say what time the break came back. So that gives me an idea of you know, the behavior, and, and then I'll refer to that later. You know, the bird, the male comes every two hours, say, on average, to uh, change nest duties, you know, incubate the eggs, and that's, you know, that's always great. And, and, and sometimes I'll go back to that, but even just the process of writing it down, you, you start getting these patterns of animals, so it's really good to journal. But other than that, I don't, is you can't be uh, playing games, you know, video games, or, or you know, uh, uh, surfing the net. And of course, in Mexico, in Chiapas, was kind of difficult to get any service. But no, I just, I just, you know, watch and wait, and and I like watching and looking, and you always, there's always something happening, you know. Communing with nature. Communing with nature. That's right. <laughs> if you want to use that, um, I love it. Uh, some clarification. One person said, I thought Tom previously said he sets his camera compensation at minus one third, but did I misunderstand his previous statement? Because now it seems like you were saying that you use minus three. Yeah, and I was actually going to stop the, the, the talk when I said that because I realized that was confusing. It's a minus one third, but it, it, oftentimes you, you look through the camera, it's a three, but it's a point three. So it's a, a minus one third, not a minus three. Thank you for that clarity. That, that, no, I was going to clarify, but thank you. Great question. Very important. Uh, one more. I wanted to know how Tom deals with sensor dust and how you may recommend cleaning of sensors. I always seem to find specs when using wider angle lenses, especially in blue skies. I use a blower brush, you know, turn the camera upside down, you know, lock up the mirror, blow it out, and otherwise I don't touch the sensor until I get back home and let my real technical guy do that. <laughs> And then, of course, we end up with lots of dust, and, but you can't, it, it's tedious and things, but you know, the last thing you want to do is screw up your sensor in the field. That's great. Um, any questions again in the room? Great, you guys are quiet, that's good. Uh, we have Janelle BR, and a lot of people have asked for this. Uh, have you ever felt threatened when out in the field? Um, you did talk about not wanting to startle people or whatever, but, or startle animals. If so, could you elaborate? to hear if you've had any stories where you have felt threatened. I know you said earlier that you don't antagonize, you make sure to keep yourself as 
uh, calm as possible all that. Yeah, another pretty common question when you're out with big animals and things, and, and I've, you know, like in Alaska, walked through alder bush, uh, deep alder bush, thinking that the moose was over there and didn't realize there was a moose right there. And during the rut, and you surprise, you know, a moose, a, a big bull one time, you know, it was very close, and he jumped up, and, and you had these certain behaviors, and I just dropped my tripod and my lens, and I ran. <laughs> now, you don't do that with bears, because if you run, and you don't do that with cougars, and so, so you have to know those certain things, but if you run from, he just wants you out of the way. And then as soon as he walked off, I went back, got my tripod and my camera. Um, there's been time where I have surprised a bear in the woods, uh, you know, looking for elk, much like these elk hunters do sometimes, and, and uh, uh, surprise, like bears, surprise when they're on a food carcass, surprise when they're with young, surprise in general, is, is when you see um, an animal, like a, a bear especially, it might attack you. Um, a cougar, you know, laying along a trail, you're running in the evening, the, you know, the cougar sees this movement, thinks it's a deer, and it's instinctive to run after it, so it might attack a human running. That's why you don't run at dusk in cougar country by yourself. Um, I've been in the, um, on Hudson Bay in the summertime, late summer, where I was uh, looking for snow geese, and there was a polar bear that I realized was stalking me, because polar bears, unlike grizzly bears, are totally uh, carnivorous, and anything that's meat is more interesting to them than grass. And uh, so he was stalking me. Unfortunately, I was, I, I was close enough to the tundra buggy that I had that I could get back to it. But you know, that was scary. Uh, another polar bear time, I was with the, actually National Geographic film crew when we went out on the ice from the tundra buggy. There's a stairway le led down to the ice and there's a mother polar bear coming across the ice. And I wanted to get that low angle, not from the high tundra buggy. And there's a storm just came up out of nowhere, just a white out snowstorm. And a friend of mine, Spence Wilson, he was in his 90s then. He was a guard up on the Thunder Buggy. And he started yelling something at us. And all I could look up and I could see him yelling. And I thought, what the heck, you know? So then he pointed and I saw this, other, this old gnarly polar bear. He was like, only had three teeth left in his head. And those are the ones that are hungry, obviously. Yeah. Young ones, old ones typically are more more likely to be trouble, because again, they don't, can't kill things as easily. And if it weren't for Spence, seeing this bear who was stalking um, the, us, the film crew, um, might have been difficult. We didn't see him until, you know, he came through this blow, blowing snow, and then we just dropped the gear, and I shoved these geographic guys up the, up the, uh, the uh, ladder. And I again left my tripod and my camera there, and the bear went around. I thought, oh, he's going to knock it over in the ice, and it was an expensive, you know, Aeroflex camera, you know, about sixty thousand dollars sitting on the tripod, and he just sort of sniffed it and went on. But other than those sort of three or four instances, I've never felt. Uh, I'm always aware. Again, I, I you know, uh, lots of times, like, you know, getting bears in Alaska and things get your attention, they come through the woods, and I've had them come from here to the wall, out to the salmon stream, and you're sitting there on a rock, uh, but he was looking for salmon. So I've been lucky, and I hope I don't screw up. Do you ever feel that animals like, say, 399, that you've, you've had a lot of exposure to and been around, do you feel that she might be comfortable with you, that she recognizes you? Oh, that's, you know, I. I always hate to say that, you know, you know the bear or something, but honestly, she, of course she would, she smells certain people or vehicles. It's like my dog, I can let my dog run out at night from my, my office. He'll go down the sidewalk, he'll, he'll smell my car, you know, out of 50 cars. And of course, bears have probably 10 times better uh, olfactory sense than the dog does, which is quite good. And so certainly, 399 recognizes my smell, and probably uh, my car. Now she seems to be wary of white cars, which are the Ranger cars, uh, who sometimes, you know, haze her. That kind of M and M series. So they recognize color, and there's a few other people, friends of mine that I know that spend a lot of time with 399, and they seem to be cross in front. And Sue's one of them. She's a little Subaru, 
and 399 seems to cross N610 more often in front of, say, our cars, these cars are out there a lot, than they do randomly or behind us. So you'd only have to think that, yes, she recognizes the cars and smells and stuff. That isn't, you know, but without saying any more than that, I can, and I, I've seen 399 a couple of times uh, when she crossed the river, that picture I've gotten. I didn't, I thought she was in the carcass and she had crossed the river during the night. And I was setting up for her carcass and um, I'd gone out there early in the morning and uh, she was sleeping in the willows only about 15 feet away. And I made plenty of noises with a friend of mine and I was, she got up, she looked and I recognized her. I thought, hmm, I wasn't worried about her. She wasn't worried about me. She uh, went up on the hill, stood up, came down the hill and crossed the river. Now, I don't know if she'd do that with anybody or not, or I don't know if there's any difference, but you know, I think she was just a good bear, basically. Whether it had anything to do with me or not, I don't know. But you, you always like to think that maybe they know you're cool. <laughs> <laughs> so. Great. Uh, I think, oh, do we have one more? Perfect. Um, just a question about when you're out in the field. I know a lot of the videos we've seen, you've got assistants or film crews with you, but when you're out shooting for you, do you go take somebody with you? Because I often have people tell me that I'm crazy going out by myself, um, and I have to, of course, leave where I'm going and all that good stuff so that somebody knows where to find me. <laughs> but are you usually by yourself on your own projects, or do you have a, like a, a partner, a friend, somebody tag along? Uh, both. When I'm at a home, I often go out by myself and, or take my partner with me or a friend, or a buddy, or somebody who might be just interested in going along. You know, it's great to share. You know, so if you come, I'll take you. Um, so it's, it's, it's nice to share things, and plus you've got another set of eyes, or another driver, or, you know, like this, the bear instance, where with this guy, I had my back turned to, to the bear, and I was actually trying to call a friend of mine on, on, a, on a cell phone who was gonna meet us there, and I was watching in the darkness for him to come over the hill, and I was on the phone, and my friend said, Tom, there's a bear right behind you. <laughs> you know, and, and so it's, you know, when you're in, you know, bear country especially, it's, it's good to have somebody with you in those kinds of things. If you're not in bear, cougar, say predator, predator country, and but sometimes I like to just be alone, it's great. 